This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And talking of masters of horror, it doesn't get much bigger than today's guest, Paul Tremblay, and he has won the Bram Stoker, British Fantasy, and even the This Is Horror Award. He is the author of many amazing books, including his latest novel, Survivor Sung, which we talk about in this conversation, Growing Things, The Cabin at the End of the World, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and perhaps my personal favourite, A Head Full of Ghosts. And in this conversation... We talk about so much. Not only do we get into Survivor Song, as I already mentioned, but we talk about pandemics, we talk about film adaptations, we contrast and compare zombies and the infected, and a hell of a lot more. But before any of that, as always, a quick word from our sponsors. Mark Tufo, Chris Philbook, and David Moody have sold millions of books about the end of the world between them. Now they're joining forces to destroy the entire universe. A war is raging between gods and demons with an unstoppable interdimensional terror, the Bleed, destroying everything it touches. From ancient alien civilizations through to modern day London through to deep space and beyond, nothing and no one is safe. The Bleed wants flesh. It wants to destroy life. It wants to be worshipped. Three Worlds, Three Authors, The Mother of All Apocalypses. The Bleed, Rupture, is released July 14th as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook exclusive from Audible. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. All right, with that said, here it is. It is a conversation with Paul Tremblay. On This Is Horror. Paul, welcome back to This Is Horror podcast. This is the fifth time that we've spoken with you. Uh, Very happy to be back. Um, I'm expecting some sort of pen or maybe even like a lounge chair in the mail sent to me that says This Is Horror UK on it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure Bob Pastorella will be happy to arrange that for you. So I'll delegate. (laughs) I'll delegate that as I delegate many duties to Bob. So he's on it. Sure. Yeah. What what am I doing? (laughs) You're just just writing This Is Horror UK on a chair and sending it to Paul. So we're doing the chair and not the pickle jar. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, that, that's a good one uh, to, to make sure you don't have that mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> um, since my dog was just barking, I'll have to remind everybody that, well, since I'm sure everybody listening is in the same boat as we are, you know, I'm in a house with the four people who live here and with my dog, who I think during the pandemic has gotten, you know, she totally senses something is off. Um, from like she didn't used to bark at stuff now she'll just bark at things that pass by the house um the weirdest part is that when i take her for a walk she now poops in the street on pavement like i'm like what what are we doing <laughs> <laughs> you know um you know i try to explain my dog that just because we're you know experiencing a pandemic it doesn't mean that you know you can poop in the street 
Yeah. That's frowned upon. <laughs> so anyway, th that's a great way to start off the podcast. But anyway, so if you hear my dog, that's Holly. Just being Holly. Yeah. Well, I mean, as long as it's only your dog that is pooping in the street. I mean, there's obviously <laughs> protests going on at the moment. So I don't know if... You know, that, that's something that you and your family are doing, a kind of dirty protest to, to show your frustration no, no. right now. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, the main reason that we're talking today, apart from pooping in the street, is because you've got <laughs> Survivor Sun coming out imminently. In fact, in one month from when we're recording or one month in my time zone i guess one month and right. one day <laughs> for you and bob <laughs> but i mean this novel seems so relevant to our times i mean in terms of this apocalyptic nature you've got quarantines you've got rations you've got violence and brutality so in many ways i'm sure this story is oddly more relevant now than when you were writing it. So I'd love it if you could speak a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I would say it felt more relevant to me, I don't know, maybe before, you know, before all the protests exploded in the United States. Um, just because, you know, the, the book is really focused on the outbreak of a virus. And, you know, I certainly did not predict any of uh, the protests and, in civil unrest in the United States. Um, you know, I envisioned it as more almost as like an anti-apocalyptic novel in some ways, because um, I set out to tell the story of two characters, Romola uh, Sherman, who's a, a pediatrician born in England, um, and her best friend, Natalie. Um, and the two of them are, are caught up in the outbreak of, a, a, of this weird um extra virulent man i can't say that word i've tried saying virulent on like three yeah. different <laughs> interviews and i yeah. screwed up every time <laughs> um r rabies virus um so no like the virus and it takes place essentially you know with the exception of maybe um you know i, I don't want to spoil anything with the exception of one small part of the book you know the whole story really only takes place over like five to six hours um uh, so, you know, there's this wider maelstrom happening. And, you know, I, I really tried to focus in on the personal, like how, how you know, what are these two characters doing? Um, you know, why are they doing what they're doing? Like, how are they, you know, trying to get help? How are they surviving and the choices they have to make? Um, so I would say, like, sort of, like, obviously, <laughs> obviously there being a virus, I think what, what makes the book feel like wow this you know you could have written like he didn't or make people say wow he i can't believe he wrote this before uh, coronavirus um my sister is a nurse at a big city hospital in boston and when i had the idea for the book um you know i, I knew i was going to use rabies you know so i had done some research on rabies but m the bulk of the research after that came from i wanted to know what not the not not the national response to an outbreak of a virus would be because i feel like we've all seen those movies and read those books about the cdc etc i wanted to really sort of zone in on the lo local response like what would a small hospital do what would you know what would this uh, the small region response be to such a you know, an emergency so i really lean on my sister or for help and unfortunately she sort of got a preview of what's happening now um in 2014 when uh ebola a few ebola patients Landed on, uh, arrived in the United States infected with Ebola. Um, I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys remember. Yeah. But, you know, there was obviously mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, people didn't know, like, you know, were, were you know, had they, you know, did they infect anybody else on the plane, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, is the, you know, is the virus sort of, you know, all these terms that we now are second nature to us. Like, is it being community, you know, is there, um, is it being passed, you know, is it, ah, see, I've already forgot it, but is there uh, communal, infections, etc. So anyway, um, my sister, like her hospital was going to take, you know, if there were, if there were going to be Ebola patients, her hospital is going to take a bunch. And, you know, I think it's probably typical, like at first when people really aren't sure what's going on, like the hospital was like somewhat oddly, I don't want to say cavalier about it, but like, we're already like, yeah, you know, we're not going to have hazmat enough hazmat suits for everyone. So we're just going to have to like double gown up. <laughs> 
you know, and duct tape like your sleeves and just like what crazy stuff. So, um, you know, luckily the hospital sort of took a breath and came to its senses and said, all right, we'll, you know, we'll deal with volunteers, but just some of the, the discussion of PPE and, you know, there's a text exchange that I use within the novel survivor song where nurses discussing what's going on with their hospital, what's going on at their hospital with the virus. Um, that is based on a text exchange that my sister had between her and some coworkers, you know, during, uh, during 2014. Um, so anyway, there's a big rambling spiel to open, <laughs> um, you know, to open the podcast. Nah, it's so good. And that's what we'd, we'd expect and hope for. And <laughs> I mean, in, in terms of these conversations with your sister about working at the hospital in Boston, I mean, what, what were some of the most surprising things when you were learning about what that looked like on a day to day basis? Well, I mean, I don't know if anything was surprising per se, but like, you know, I was able to see some of like what the emergency response plans and less surprising to me was more, more of a comfort, like the, the emergency response, but made sense to me, like the idea of restricting, you know, the idea of restricting the, you know, the number of exits and entrances into the hospital. So you can still service people who weren't infected with the virus, et cetera. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff was, um, I don't know, oddly reassuring in a way, you know, at the time of writing the book, because nothing was happening, you know, <laughs> you know, the idea that, oh, some really smart people have already planned for these contingencies, you know, at the time, there was a measure of comfort. Uh, and I suppose there still is. I mean, you know, I, obviously, it depends on where you live. You know, where I live in Massachusetts was one of the hot, one of the hot spots in the United States initially for the virus, we were hit pretty hard. Um, we're on sort of the other side of the curve right now, you know, knocking all the wood. So, um, after I think some initial mistakes and you know not closing closing things down maybe a week too late um, you know things are are, are trending in a, in a better direction here in terms of the virus um, yeah so I don't know if there was a lot of mis um, a lot of surprises in that regard um, and again I, I tried not to make it like you know we're talking about the the research you know I, research is one of my least favorite things to do as a writer. Uh, partly because I'm just not comfortable doing it. Like, you know, I was a math, I studied math in college and high school, so I didn't have to do a lot of research. I'm just not comfortable in, in doing it correctly. <laughs> just, it was never my thing. Um, that's why I write fiction. I like making stuff up. So what I, what I try to do for the books, I feel like I hopefully armed myself with enough information and then just let my imagination go wild. So, you know, I would assure readers that it's certainly not like a dry, I hope it's not a dry, just sort of like info dump of stuff. Because it certainly becomes a point in the novel where you know, you don't really need to know about like the the hospital stuff anymore. It just sort of takes off on its own. I mean, I guess some of the other weird things that happen in the novel that sort of parallel what's happening today. Uh, you know, I would not say that I'm any sort of Kreskin or anything. I don't think it took too much of imagination to 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 make an educated guess that, especially in the United States, where a large you know a percentage of the right wing is obsessed with conspiracy theory. You know, it didn't take a huge leap of imagination by me, I don't think, to imagine that there would be, you know, some people who thought the virus was a hoax. Um, you know, I didn't think we would get, like, what we got, like, the armed bands of angry white men, like, um, basically, you know, uh, protesting for the right to what? I don't know, get a haircut? Or, yeah. Or, or just yeah. walk around without a mask? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> My my uh, my conspiracy <laughs> theory folks are a little bit different in the book, and and again they don't take over the novel. They're sort of like a set piece that that you know an important one that shows up. And again, it also I don't think it it, it certainly didn't take a genius or a future reader to to guess that you know my federal government would have a really shitty response to something like this, <laughs> a really ill-informed, crappy response. Yeah, and the, the thing with like a load of men with guns protesting to have a haircut. If you had written that, then at the time, people would have probably said, Paul, I know that they can overreact, but you might have to rein <laughs> right. this in. That's just not believable. They're not going to protest <laughs> for a haircut. But fast forward. It's, yeah. Yeah. It, I, I don't even know what to say. It. This world is becoming increasingly strange where it, it's difficult to separate fact and fiction and, and fact and reality seems to be 
at times less believable than, than the stories that we're creating. Sure. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think in some ways, like, you know, this book sort of takes that on a little bit, um, like real in a, in a more realistic way, not a supernatural way. Whereas, you know, the idea of what's fact and fiction is something I've always wrestled with, in, or particularly in my previous novels, like the idea of what's real and what's not, you know, and obviously playing with the supernatural. But I don't know, I kind of feel like, you know, Survivor Song, even though there's no supernatural element, to me, I felt like, I felt like it was the book after The Cabin at the End of the World. Like, Cabin at the End of the World, to me, sort of hits on some of the same ideas, but obviously there's the ambiguous supernatural element. You know, and Cabin sort of ends with the ultimate question of, you know, are you going to decide to go on? And to me, Survivor Song was, okay, well, wh what is the horror of going on? Or, or, you know, what is the story of of, of trying to survive? Um, yeah, so there you go. Another uh, tangential, <laughs> a mm -hmm. tangential answer. I've been in my house for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking to myself in my head. <laughs> Right. Uh, you've, uh, your listeners, I'm sure, are doing the same. Yeah. Anyway. Right, right. Because, uh, yeah. I mean, it, as, as we've said before, your day job is teaching high school mathematics. But, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing yeah. that the schools have been closed for quite a while now. And I, I, I don't know if you have any, well, not you personally, but if America has any plans to reopen the schools. I know that in Japan, the schools are just reopening now and they're going to be reopening in the UK, but schools mm -hmm. can decide not to. So I'm, I'm not even sure how that works because there, there's an announcement that they are being reopened. But then if the school decides they don't want to, then then fair enough. So what, what's the situation in America? Um, I mean, it's, it typically goes state by state, but I haven't heard of any schools that are still open in the United States. I could be wrong, but you know, I mean, most of them closed and went to some form of remote teaching. Mm -hmm. um, at least in the Northeast, that, that's what happened. So I, I spent about two and a half months teaching my classes you know, via the laptop, essentially. Um, you know, and I teach at a small private school, so you know, I didn't have to deal with, like, I couldn't imagine the nightmare must have been for a public school where you've got like 30 students per class. Um, so, I mean, it was hard teaching remotely, um, but, you know, I know I definitely had it easier than most teachers. Uh, my school year just ended, uh, I had my last meetings uh, on Friday. So we're on sort of official summer and, you know, we're already talking about what the, what the fall would look like. Um, the new buzzword around here is a, hy a hybrid a hybrid uh, classroom, mm. um, meaning not all of the students would be in school at once. So some would be in class, some would be at home. So you would have to teach a lesson that both would be able to have access to. So, you know, I don't know if that's going to come to pass, but I mean, based on, you know, the guidelines in my state of Massachusetts, um, which I do think have been re reasonably conservative in terms of when I say conservative, I mean, in terms of like, not just letting everybody run, run wild. It's like, I feel comfortable that they're really trying to ease our way into, you know, different stages of, of, of contact, et cetera. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any way it's going to be normal school in September. Yeah. I think if there is, you know, I think it, it's either going to be remote teaching again, or maybe early in the fall, we try the hybrid thing. Right. Until that's not, until, it, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's the hard thing, right? We just don't know. Um, and it's not like we, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it seems a little bit trite to say, you know, the, I don't know about you guys, but every time I see a commercial, especially in, in the very beginning of us being quarantined at home, like all those commercials, oh, in this uncertain times. I mean, I think that's part of the unease, you know, besides being terrified of a virus that could kill you. <laughs> Uh, and they can, you know, they can kill millions of people, potentially, um, is the idea of being confronted, oh, on, on certain times. Have we ever really had certain times? I mean, yeah, you, you can know that. I, know. I mean, I think we, we understand we understand that almost like um, we can almost we can almost understand that as an abstract thing. Oh, yeah, no times are ever sure. Right. You know, there's always uncertain times, but. You know, most of us go through our day-to-day -day lives thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do this week, this is what I'm doing next week. 
but obviously, you know, going through the pandemic sort of laid bare that now there, you know, <laughs> things can change really quickly <laughs> in like mm-hmm. irreparably and in ways that you can can't imagine. Yeah, I mean, I guess we've always, as you say, had uncertain times. It's just that there's even more uncertainty on top of the no, base that's, level that's... of uncertainty. <laughs> Yes, that's more than fair. <laughs> yeah, in the South, is, it's kind of crazy because, you know, I think that to me, it seems like if you look at the United States as a whole, that the East Coast and the West Coast are taking, have been taking this a lot more seriously. In the South, I live in Texas. A lot of people think that Texas is, is wide open, and it's not. Um, you know, I, I work in retail. I walk across the highway from a Best Buy. You can't even go into the Best Buy. So it's, you know, there's, there's uncertainty in every, in every area, it seems like. And there's uncertainty in, within, you know, different regions and different states and, and exactly what, what you can and can't do. But, you know, I don't know what, what they could lead off with these on these commercials. Right. There's got to be some guy who's like, well, hey, no, no, no. They use the words uncertain times. <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let me write that down. Uncertain taste by. And then, you know, because, I mean, when are they going to say, you know, it's like in these really shitty times. Yeah, I would <laughs> prefer that. <laughs> I, I Me too. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's almost like, God damn, dude, the times have been uncertain for decades you know, longer than that since we've been here, <laughs> since the earth started, <laughs> you know, millennia. So it's just, I don't know. But I feel, and maybe I'm wrong just because I'm like in the South, but I feel like the East and West Coast have got, it seems like they have a better grip on there. If you look at states, now you get into the South, though, you know, you got, I think Georgia, they want to just open everything up. You know, it's like if I had friends that were going, hey, we're going to go take a vacation in Georgia. I'd be like, I would not go there. <laughs> yeah. You might well, want I mean, to stay I think, here. <laughs> right. I think, well, I think part of it was, you know, the East Coast and West Coast is where the virus first appeared. So, exactly. you know, obviously New York, it, it will first appear in Washington and then, you know, in and around San Francisco and then New York City, obviously in Boston. It's just, you know, mm-hmm. we were hit the hardest and earliest in the country. So, so in, a, in a weird way. You know, they've sort of, and I don't know, it's hard. I don't want to jinx and say they figured out an approach because this, the virus is still so new. Right. You know, we don't know. We don't know everything about it yet. Um, I think we, we had no choice but to take it seriously because we can see. We can see what it was doing. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just in Massachusetts, this is not a huge state. It's about maybe 6 million people total, you know, in a fairly small area, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially compared to Texas. Uh I don't know. You know, we're, we're up to like over 7,000 deaths. I mean, there's a lot of people, <laughs> right, uh, you is. know, died, you know, especially in Massachusetts, especially within the nursing home community. I think where for a while it was like half the deaths were, were, you know, people who are nursing homes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So Survivor Song, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but as I was going to say, <laughs> in, in Survivor Song, in, in, you know, what, what I've read, that you, you you really do a good job of conveying that information in a way that is not, you know, obviously info dub, that is also in a way for us to become attached to our two characters, our two main characters, which I think in a, in a story like this, that that's, probably paramount over everything is that the, these two characters have to be, you know, relatable, you know, all the, all the, the good, the good character characteristics, boy, that, that didn't really sound great, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, they had, you, you, you got some compelling characters here. Well, thank you. You know, um, and was that like something that, that had to, to go in at the beginning yeah, I mean this. I mean this book more than like maybe even other ones just started with this book started with a what if that I can't say because it totally spoils the whole book. <laughs> right. <laughs> so in some ways it was interesting using that as a starting point. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, and then I was like, okay, so I've got this, you know, it's definitely like a sort of like a riff on zombies somewhat. Um, you know, it's sort of like a knowing riff on zombies where, you know, some of the characters even argue about that these aren't zombies. You know, they're real people affected by rabies. You know, they're not. <laughs> Stop calling them zombies, et cetera. Um, and so once I had some of the bones of, of the story in place, I really wanted to have like, you know, the wider maelstrom happening and really zero in on the two characters. Um, and then, and essentially tell the story almost in real time. Like maybe the amount of time it takes you to read this book sort of fits with, you know, the length of time of, of Ramola's and Natalie's story. Um, which was, which was, um, a challenge. You know, I'd never tried anything like that before. Um, you know, there's no supernatural element to this book, which is certainly uh, new compared to the last, you know, the previous uh, three novels that, I, that I'd written, uh, you know, the previous three horror novels, obviously. So there's no ambiguous supernatural element. Um, so I couldn't lean on that. <laughs> I really had to, I really had to lean on the characters on this one. Um, you know, my hope is like, you know, the feedback that I've gotten so far from people is like the first 100 or so pages maybe 120 are the hardest part to read because it's really you're in the thick of, you know, the outbreak of the virus and principles and stuff. And then my hope is it, it, it goes slightly, you know, it goes to a different place from there where hopefully it doesn't feel as claustrophobically now. <laughs> um, there's a new phrase for you, claustrophobically now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I do think, you know, there's a measure of, I've been, I've been um, gratified to hear that, some people took, you know, a measure of hope from the book um, as well. You know, it's not to say that there's like a super happy ending at the end of this. You know, I won't say if there is or not. I think that's left up to, you know, the, mm -hmm. up to the reader to decide if it's, you know, what kind of ending it is. But, you know, I also make pains. It was funny when I did it. Um, so I'd mentioned like, I think I had mentioned earlier, something about, you know, some nonsense about an anti-apocalyptic novel because I... I don't know, you maybe you haven't read to this part in the book yet, but I do make a point of mentioning as a, the narrator intrudes at one point and says, you know, the, you know, the virus doesn't herald the end of the United States, the world, or, or even, you know, the state of Massachusetts, you know, things will eventually get better. And to me, that makes the story, you know, for some of the characters, maybe even more tragic because, you know, um, most of every, most, most of the state survives, you know, um, but there are people who don't, and mm -hmm. that's, um, I don't know. So in some ways to me, that, that seems maybe even more horrific than sort of the big splashy apocalypse, everyone dies. I mean, that's just so hard to get your head around, to, to really imagine the, the human, you know, the, the grief of that, of everybody dying. Um, and I certainly didn't want to do that. And part of it is because that's one of my fears, is living to see the apocalypse. Uh, so much of my early short fiction were was about that fear, about living to see, <laughs> you know, the end. Um, my my short story collection. In the meantime, like ten of the thirteen stories are either apocalyptic or pre-apocalyptic, or in the midst of it. Um, so with this book, I tried to allay my own fears a little bit by saying, "Hey, you know, this isn't the end of everything. This is, mm -hmm. but for these six hours, it is an apocalypse for those mm -hmm. characters." Well, you have to look at these type of things, you know, I, I see, and there's probably multiple ways you could do it, but for the most part, if you're faced with something, some people will try to avoid anything like it because right. it reminds them it's painful and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. And you have other people who will face it head on, right? especially in fiction because they know they're just a safety net. And they know that they can they can become stronger, possibly, by it. Of course, you know the story could wreck them. <laughs> you know that's, you know, but they know that going in, and that that and that's how they cope. So and, and think that in real life situations, people are are the same way. You know. So. But yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm definitely the former. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think like. I know, uh, like, I, I certainly haven't been see seeking out the movie Contagion in the last few months. I know that was, like, number one in Netflix for a while, which mm -hmm. sort of blew me away. Um, no, so I get it if people don't want to read something that's close. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, it's close, but, you know, in a lot of ways, it, it's different, too. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm laughing because in the first few weeks when I was home by myself, like for most people, I think that was really some of the hardest times. Those first few weeks were we had no idea what to expect or what was going on. And in Massachusetts, the cases were really just exploding. Um, you know, didn't know how bad it was going to get. Obviously, super worried about my sister and, you know, super worried about everybody. Um, yeah. So, like, I couldn't even, like, I, I did an interview with somebody and I felt like I was apologizing for having written the book. You know, which, like, and I didn't mean to do that. And I certainly didn't mean it in any sort of, like, um, you know, bragging way or, oh, look how smart I was that I saw this was coming. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, right. But it just felt like this weird idea to be like, uh, you know, or it was more like, I'm sorry if you have to read this now because I, I don't want to deal with it. I, I just want to turn on the TV and watch like Animal Planet, <laughs> which is what I did for like the first two weeks that I was at home. And then obviously like, you know, you or most of us, no matter how strange things get, most of us get used to uh, a new routine or a new, a new quote unquote normal, um, right. you know, which is weird, you know, I mean, but I guess maybe that's what survival is. You know, we, I hear it, we hear it so often, you know, when are we going to go back to normal? And, and I tend to, to be a little, you know, a little sarcastic sometimes and say, I'd like to introduce you to your new normal. <laughs> this is it. Right. We're probably not going to go back to the way things were. We're going to modify this normal so much that you're going to forget about the old normal. And it's going to take a while, but this is the new normal. Yeah. I'm very ominous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, yeah. You know. No, and you're so right. we have to adapt. Yeah. You're delivering the bleak bombs on the podcast, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Paul, you spoke about obviously during these times we create new routines and we have to adapt. And I mean, I wonder during these weird times, I mean, have there been any new routines or things that you've picked up or perhaps things that you think you might take going forward that are actually a positive effect on your life? Um, I mean, <laughs> part of it was just like the mentality that, oh my God, we're all closing the house together. Like there was initially, not that I've done a ton of traveling compared to maybe some people, but for me, you know, the last couple of years um, with, with book stuff, I, I did do a lot of traveling. It was away from, from Lisa and, and my kids and Cole uh, my son just did his freshman year in college, so he was away. So, I mean, for me, like the only positive has been, well, I've, you know, I've, I've, I feel like I've stolen some time with my family um, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. I, I, I would change everything back to normal, to, uh, you know, in a, in a heartbeat. But I mean, that has been, you know, if the lone positive is, you know, just getting to be with, with um in terms of routine and stuff, it's it's been weird. Like, I mean, I'm in. It took me a little while to get into reading. I had a hard time, but uh, I broke through by going back and rereading some Peter Straub books that helped break the dam initially. And now again, I'm talking like the first week or two. Um, so I've been, you know, just reading a lot, and I've been able to write in fits and spurts a few times, like for a few weeks. It went really well. I'm back in a lull, you know, just because I can't turn myself away from the news currently, you know, which is fine. Um, you know, fine that I don't have a creative want right now. There are more important things happening in the world. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's just going to be a continual, like everybody, a continual process. How do you, you know, how do you keep going? How do you, how do you stay informed? How, how do you keep some form of, of mental health? Um, you know, especially for those who, who have who struggled with it previously. Um, you know, those are <laughs> all the things that that's been poured into this crucible of, of pandemic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean you mentioned earlier how you included people reacting to the events and survivor song like, oh, it's a conspiracy theory and it's a hoax. And I mean I loved in the the prelude that you basically included every single 
reaction. I mean, you even had the anti-vaxxers. You had yeah. <laughs> some dude basically trolling and saying, I ate four baits and now my erection is huge and green and it won't go away. Yeah. Hulk smash. And I, I just love the fact that you just decided to to include every single reaction that you might get on Facebook or on other social <laughs> media. And I mean, if, pe if people kind of went back and they looked at how people reacted initially to coronavirus, with the exception of the big green erection, I think you've covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I've never shied away from making allusions to social media or, you know, or technology in my stories. I mean, because those are a part of, of the now, right? I mean, I'm, I'm worried about trying to, uh, you know, I'm trying to write a book of like describing our experience or, or at least my experience. And, you know, in this case, when I was writing, it was 2019, <laughs> um, you know, it was a head full of ghosts. It was 2015, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I was listening um, a few months ago. I was listening to an audio book of the Blitz, uh, an audio book about the Blitz of London during World War II, and how many of the residents were encouraged to keep diaries, you know, so there would be some sort of historical record of, of their experience. And a lot of a lot of what became this um, non a lot of what became this book, and it was by um, is it Richard Larson? I'm so bad with names. I, I think it's Richard. Uh, he wrote The Devil in the White City. Anyway, he, he's a fairly famous nonfiction writer. He wrote, you know, this book about World War II and Churchill. So I, know, I was fascinated by the idea. I was like, wow, there are these, you know, thousands of, of Londoners, you know, writing diaries, the experience of the nightly bombings. And, you know, they had all these hundreds of thousands of diaries. So, I don't know, you can see it playing out now um, in the U.S., you know, where, you know, pandemic is converging with civil rights. Uh, expression that you know social media is going to be is the record right social media is going to be the historical record what people say or, you know we will you know presuming all that stuff is saved somehow <laughs> you know you can see everyone's reaction you get to see it in live time yeah yeah well i think unfortunately it's saved too much but that's a separate yeah. conversation yeah there are people sure. saving yeah. these conversations and companies that certainly shouldn't be um, and as, right, yeah, yeah, it's a whole other <laughs> can of worms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and as, as a technical note, so The Devil in the White City is written by Eric Larson. Ah, uh, Eric, why don't we say Richard? Oh, I know a Richard Larson, that's why. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, you're reading oh, well. it. You read The Splendid and the Vile. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I listen to the audio, like when I walk my dog of, to try to squeeze more books into my life. When, when I take my dog for walks, I, I listen to audio books um when i listen to audiobooks i tend to do non-fiction i have a harder time doing audio fiction if i'm walking my dog because i feel like you know if you're walking the dog and have to clean up your mess in the street as we talked about earlier <laughs> you know i can be distracted from the book and with non-fiction i feel like it's easier to pick up the thread you know if i miss a small detail it's probably not the you know yeah i can still go on with the book kind of thing whereas with fiction sometimes i feel like i get lost if i do that yeah yeah i mean i i would certainly agree with that i think i'd say podcasts and conversations are the easiest to listen to then non-fiction sure. then for me i find first person narration is easier than third person so um I, that makes sense yeah I, I i guess it's like the more personal in in a sense the easier it is for me to to listen to it and of course more minimalist prose are going to be easier than i guess more poetical and maximalist i don't know if that's the term that people would use it's a term richard thomas has used before so who, who's to argue with him not me so <laughs> i'm going for it <laughs> but i mean you, you said I like that. yeah yeah you said as well i mean it, the infected in your books i mean they're, they're not they're not zombies, but I think they are zombie tangential in the same way that <laughs> that they were in David Moody's Hater, and then I guess to a lesser extent, Twenty Eight Days Later. 
So, I mean, right. when you were coming up with this, were you kind of thinking about how you wanted to make sure that they weren't zombies, but that they did have some similar elements and characteristics? I mean, I, I, I guess in many ways, though, even if you fucking try not to make <laughs> the antagonist a zombie, if it's in an apocalyptic-like book or even an anti-apocalyptic book, that there's invariably going to be comparisons. Yeah, so, I mean, fairly early on, I, I try not to worry about that issue. Of, it's like, oh, it's a zombie versus infected. I mean, I guess part of my shtick, <laughs> I, I can say that I have shtick, especially with the novels that, you know, it looks like I've been taking tropes, like, you know, each book, and then trying to even and trying to ground it in reality in some ways, or try to take like a, a realistic approach. So I was like, all right, you know, how could we have? Again, I want to mention the what if that 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 the, the book grew into. So I knew I needed some sort of not a, if not a zombie, then like a zombie like thing. And, and and rabies sort of occurred to me right away because it's such a bizarre and interesting virus. And I really didn't. I mean. Well, that's probably not true. I mean, I, I, I tried as much as I could to take just real rabies <laughs> and move up uh, and move up the timeline of infection. You know, so obviously, you know, even though, like if humans get rabies, they're they're not going to be as as bitey and aggressive <laughs> as they are in my book. Although maybe if the virus is that much more virulent, there we go again, because it infects you quicker, maybe it would. But you know, so that's probably like the least realistic part of it is the idea of 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 people biting, you know, because our teeth just aren't made um, <laughs> to bite skin and affect that way. Um, but in terms of like how the virus works, you know, how it's it's not in the bloodstream, how it attaches to a nerve, et cetera, all that is, is actual rabies, like such a such a bizarre virus. So I mean, that was kind of fun to to play with. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, another element that we haven't actually mentioned is that during all of this, Natalie is pregnant and not just pregnant, oh, but yeah. expecting <laughs> her first kid. So let's talk a little bit about that element. Right. Yeah. No, she's like 37, 38 weeks pregnant. Mm. Right. Um, sort of the thrust of the novel is, you know, she gets bitten early on, uh, um, and so a bunch of the novel is, you know, the idea is a race against time. Is there a way that they're going to be able to, because the virus vaccine still works. The problem is, you know, real rabies, if you were to be bitten, like on, when I say real rabies, the rabies that we exist with, if you were to be bitten by something that was rabid, um, it travels very slowly up your nerves, like one centimeter a day or not a day, an hour. No, I'll take that back. It's probably like one centimeter a day. Or is it an hour? I forget already. All that research has been thrown away. <laughs> but anyway, it travels so slowly. Like if you were to be bit like on the wrist or something, it would take a couple of weeks, probably minimum, before the virus travels and, and gets into your brain, which is the issue. The virus, once it passes through the brain barrier, it is no longer curable. But if you get the vaccine before it passes through the brain, then it's eminently curable. Um, so... You know, the problem in the book is like if the virus only, it only takes the virus maybe an hour to travel through, then, you know, it's can you get to the hospital in time? Can you get the vaccine in time, et cetera? Uh, so that becomes one of the questions in the book. Obviously, you know, will Natalie and, and her baby be OK? Um, you know, in writing the book, I was really aware of, you know, I certainly didn't want it to be the trope of like, oh, you know, the, the, the pregnant woman as a vessel to repopulate the earth kind of thing where the woman's only purpose there is to, you know, give birth to a healthy child. Um, you know, ho I hope readers like how, how, Nat how honest Natalie is about her wanting to survive <laughs> first and foremost. Um, I felt like I was kind of hopefully being honest w with that, like, you know, how she would feel about, you know, her situation. Um, to the point where Natalie and Ramola had a conversation about how she she dislikes the movie Children of Men, yeah, um, because of that trope. Yeah, um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I um, I hope people, you know, like <laughs> Ramola and Natalie. I mean, they were. It was a hard book to write, um, mainly because I was uncomfortable with all the research. You know, which is fine. Like I don't want to feel comfortable in writing. If I, I think if I feel comfortable, then you know, I'm not. 
it's probably not very good. Like, I think you need to feel that discomfort. Otherwise, it just becomes, ah, all right, it's just, you know, by the numbers. You know, I never wanted to feel that way. Um, but I did enjoy spending time with with those two characters quite a bit. Yeah, there was, was there a point during the composition where you felt most uncomfortable? Or was there even a point where that level of discomfort got so much that you even questioned whether you could do this? Uh, I always question whether I can do this. And it usually happens always within the first 100 pages. And then if I make it that far, I'm kind of like, well, because I've, I've, I've quit other projects before 100 pages and even once at 100 pages. So to me, that's sort of like a magical number for me. Um, but, you know, in this case, I felt like the, the, the first 100 or so pages, first 100, 120, were the most challenging because um, it dealt with more of the, the medical stuff before I could send the two characters out into <laughs> not a fantastical realm, but um, a little bit more of a story space based on imagination and supposition as opposed to the, as opposed to the research, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, no, cause I definitely wanted to get, you know, as much of the right that is that, that I could, um, you know, I mean, as well as I know, I, I was taking liberties with rabies as we discussed, cause it doesn't actually work like that, but you know, you wave the magic wand of, Hey, this is a, you know, an extra really or a super rabies. <laughs> um, you know, in the grand tradition of many uh, virus outbreak books, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you're getting a great early response to it. And I mean, remarkably so that it's not even been released yet. And if you go over to your Goodreads profile for it, which I did, you've got nearly 300 ratings <laughs> and nearly 200 reviews already. And... If you haven't checked that out, it, they are mostly positive. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be yeah. like one of those people who tags an author on social media and it's like, here's your one right, star right. review. No, people are, re are reacting really positively. I, I, I guess a lot of this yeah. is probably to do with your publisher just getting the book out there. No, they, they, yeah, my U.S. publisher has given out a ton of uh, early copies, yeah, which is great. I mean... There's no I mean to it, but there's always like the paranoid part of the author's like, oh, who's going to read the book? You're giving it away to the only people who would have bought it. <laughs> um, but no, so I mean, it's very nice to have that support to have them put out, um, you know, early copies and, you know, believe in that hopefully people will have a good response to it. Um, I have not read any of the reviews, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't go by and see the average rating. That's what typically I'll do is I'll dip in to see what the average rating looks like. But yeah. stay away from individual reviews. Yeah, that's probably a smart way of going about it for your <laughs> mental health. Just check that the average is generally yeah. looking favorable, but <laughs> maybe don't click in any further. I mean, I, I've found that now that I do have a book out, that I, yeah, I do tend to, to look at the the reviews and see what people are saying at the moment. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was Laird Barron who said that if you believe the really positive reviews, then you kind of have to believe the really negative and vice versa. So the general rule of thumb is to just not take anything too seriously. But I mean, right. it, it does seem to affect people a lot more and disproportionately more if they read a negative review than if they read a really positive review. And it's just the way that I guess our, our brains are, are hardwired, really, especially when yeah. as creatives, we're more susceptible to self-doubt. But of course, sure. it's, it's that absolute bollocks. I mean, you can't believe like, oh, this one one star review if you're not believing the the 40 or 50 or whatever five star reviews so i i do like <laughs> Laird's approach and i i think the approach of not reading reviews is a smart one but probably because i'm so early in my kind of book publishing career i it's not advice that I've taken on board. It's like, go on and let's <laughs> yeah. see. Because at this stage, it's still a novelty. Like, oh, 
fucking hell someone wrote up something about a story that i wrote so i I, i'm enjoying that and enjoying it more so if it's positive (laughs) yeah no i mean i try not to read i mean i don't go on to goodreads or amazon read reviews but like i'm more apt to like if i see something come across on twitter you know then or something like that like then my curiosity sometimes gets the best to me i click through i mean i'll you know if i get reviews from you know, if I get reviews from like a venue or something, I, I tend to dip into the, you know, read those. Um, but no, I mean, I feel like I would say I learned the hard way, but, um, you know, I've been doing this for a little while. So, I mean, I used to read everything and drive myself crazy. Mm. And, you know, at, at some point during, what do you mean during, during a head full of ghosts, like this is stupid. Why am I, I can't, I'm not going to read all, all of these. This is not, you know, I'm not, I, I didn't like what it was doing to me. So I stopped. Yeah. On the advice of some other, on, on the advice of other writers who knew more than I did. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But like even like the, it's funny. I sometimes like, you know, cause I still I use Goodreads for the things that I read too, and I'll put up reviews. And I'm at the point now, where I typically will only put up stars or, or something of something that I liked. Like I don't want to. I don't know. Just because to the point where now like I'm blurbing people's books and stuff. Like, I I don't feel like it would be cool to, you know, it'd be one thing if I was writing a review for a magazine, I feel like then I would feel the, feel the, the need to be honest for, you know, honest about my, you know, if I was hired to write a review, but you know, if it's just me at Goodreads, I'm not going to throw up, you know, two star reviews of anything anymore. I just won't, I just won't put it up. Um, But that's not to say like people, like I, I I judge people for putting bad reviews up because I don't, what the hell was the point of my I was saying? Oh, <laughs> sometimes I'll go on and see like some of my favorite writers, like Peter Straub or, or um, Megan Abbott. And so many of, I'd say almost all their books, their averages are like in the low to mid threes. And to me, that's almost like, I feel like that that's almost like a sign of a successful book because not, not that just that every, not everyone loved it. I just felt like, huh, those were, I think those were, were challenging books by some really challenging authors and, they engendered a response, right? I mean, that's kind of what you want. You don't want like, meh, or hey, that was pretty good, and everyone gives it a four. Like, I don't know. Uh, I, I know I'm, I'm drawn to the books that like people just love, and you know, and then the the same book that people might hate too, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, good reads. What a weird thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm. I mean, I've always said that I'd rather have. A load of people that love a story that I've written and a load of people hate it than just have everyone kind of fall in the middle with this lukewarm response. So, yeah, if you've got an average of three, but it's because you've got a load of five star and a load of one and two star, then job done, I think. And I mean, I I guess as well, another reason why you, you shouldn't put a lot of stock into these reviews as you have no idea as to the background of the the reader and where they're coming from and even their reasons for rating it something and different people right. rate things harsher than other people like i probably rate things a little bit harsher <laughs> um and yeah. re- really i mean sometimes as well you have people that will rate it lower because they don't like your subgenre and it's like well you should kind of be rating it within <laughs> within its genre or if you're right. Philip Fracassi you get a, a bad review because your book wasn't a videotape which is something I've referenced before but it's probably my favorite one star <laughs> review just <laughs> to say something like not a good video and well no it wouldn't be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, all that said, like the tricky part is publishers use and rely on Goodreads. I mean, it becomes part of their campaigns. Um, yeah. You know, w- w- again, which makes sense because it is a, a big snapshot of the reading public, you know, which I, I don't know what percentage, um, but it's certainly, you know, a sample of it. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's a complicated relationship with Goodreads for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I said, one of Philip Fracasse's books was not a good video, and I can't believe I'm segueing this way, but here it is. I mean, I think Survivor (laughs) Sung has an enormous amount of potential to be adapted into 
a film, so I'm wondering if any of those conversations have happened. And I know that we've spoken about other bits of your work being adapted for the screen, so I wondered if you had any news on that front. Um, you know, so with Survivor Song, I mean, it was re I mean, I took a few calls, <laughs> you know, in, in mid March, like again when we were all first, you know, uh, confined to our houses. So it was sort of weird uh, to talk to some producers <laughs> that way. So I mean, I don't know. Obviously, um, so who knows? I mean, in terms of any Hollywood interest for, for anything that you write, it's, it's so hard to predict like what people will be interested or not interested in. So. You know, it's something you know. No one should bank on. Like I certainly don't bank on it. If it happens, it's nice. Um, when I say it, like even just having like a, I don't even say just as a qualifier either. But even, you know, even having an option is amazing. It's like, it's free or found money. You know, in some ways, um, if if something gets optioned, um, you know, and what what gets options, you know, so few actually end up going all the way. It, it, you know, from all the stories that I hear, it almost seems to be a minor miracle that anything ever gets adapted at all. Um, you know, a, a head full of ghosts is, is still plugging in there. <laughs> um, you know, it keeps getting inching closer. Um, there's that they have a new director on board. They have an actress attached, uh, Margaret Qualley, who was in The Leftovers, and she was also in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The director was Scott Cooper, who did... Uh, it's a desert heart with Jeff Bridges again, butchering titles. Um, he did what else? He did uh, Black Mass, which was sort of a biopic on uh, Whitey Bulger, mm -hmm. you know, the South Boston mobster. And he had just completed his first horror movie called Antlers, which was supposed to come out in April, but you know, obviously, has been pushed to the fall. Um, so, and, and I. And there was reported that there was some sort of um, foreign rights deal that was struck, which is a you know a good sign. So I don't know. I mean, they haven't started filming. Nothing is, you know, nothing like that. So obviously, no one's filming right now, unless they're shooting, uh, you know, inside the house kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I guess it remains to be seen. I mean, the good news is that uh, the people involved are are still excited and acting like this is something that they wanted to. But, um, you know, they've had it, when I say they, the, you know, the producers have had it for five years, <laughs> um, which I guess is, actually is the average time it takes mm. to make a Hollywood movie. I've, I've heard, I don't know if that's true or if that's apocryphal, but I'm, I'm, I'm at the average or uh, heading into over average now. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, I think with these things, you just have to celebrate the stage that you get to but the oh, the kind of the kind of trap can be if people start celebrating the stage after it's like no don't do that that is not going to be good <laughs> for for your mental health or really for anything and i think i think this is how you know we we can get um almost disenfranchised with things i mean be very happy that there's an option but until there's actually oh, a film don't celebrate that part yet because i mean that well we've spoken to so many people that unfortunately that there, there can be obstacles i mean i mentioned david moody before his uh book hater was optioned by guillermo del toro but you know, mm -hmm. for for whatever reason that that kind of fell through. But as you say, he got he got yeah. the free money, so that that's a, a particularly enjoyable part. And I think at the moment it is, I think it's optioned, but it might now be attached to someone else. But yeah, just don't mm -hmm. don't celebrate what hasn't happened. <laughs> that's dangerous. <laughs> no, I mean I think it's why I mean. You can certainly like celebrate and be excited about the possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, just realize, and I, I realize, you know, I'm so incredibly fortunate, you know, to even come, you know, as close as this book has come. Um, yeah, I'm so incredibly fortunate in like countless ways. Um, and I'm, I don't know, just very thankful for it. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. You know, obviously. That, that's all any of us can do right now is just wait and see. 
for mm. a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for listening to the conversation with Paul Tremblay. Join us again next time for the second and final part. But if you would like to get that ahead of the crowd, if you would like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you get Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing. You get the video cast on camera, off record. You get Patreon only Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella. And you can submit questions to each and every interviewee. And what a load of great guests we have coming up. We've got Sarah Reed, Rena Mason, Sarah Pinbra, Adam Cesar, Gemma Amor. Many, many great guests coming on to the This Is Horror podcast. We've got a This Is Horror award show coming up soon too. This is the first time that I'm mentioning that publicly, but hey, as a podcast listener, that's the kind of thing you get. You get little inside information snippets about the workings and the goings-on in This Is Horror. And you get even more insider tips if you're a patron, so check it out, patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Have a look, see if it's a good fit for you. All right, before I wrap up, quick word from our sponsors. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Mark Tufo, Chris Philbook, and David Moody have sold millions of books about the end of the world between them. Now they're joining forces to destroy the entire universe. A war is raging between gods and demons with an unstoppable interdimensional terror that bleed, destroying everything it touches. From ancient alien civilizations through to modern day London to the deep space and beyond, nothing and no one is safe. The bleed wants flesh. It wants to destroy life. It wants to be worshipped. Three worlds, three authors, the mother of all apocalypses. The Bleed Rupture is released July 14th as a paperback, ebook, and an audiobook exclusive from Audible. Now, often I will end with a quote, but recently over on Twitter, at Wilson the Writer, I've been sharing little nuggets of information and hopefully inspiration, things that I hope will help you on your creative journey. So, I thought let's mix things up a little bit. Let's share some recent tweets and hopefully it will resonate and will help you. But if you want to follow along, follow me at Wilson the Writer and also reach out. Let me know. Do you like this? Do you want me to share more of my own personal thoughts? Or are you like actually Michael David Wilson? Can you just share? A quote from a bit of a legend like Haruki Murakami or Elbert Camus or Toni Morrison. We don't need more MDW content. We've got enough. So, yeah, let me know at Wilson the Writer. So here is something that I wrote recently that seemed to resonate with people. And hey, hope it works for you. With no input, there's no output. If you're struggling to create... Fill up at the inspiration well. Consume good art. Read. Watch. Absorb. Travel. Exercise. Learn new things. Do not self-loathe. Give yourself a break. Drink from the inspiration well. Refresh. Enjoy. I'll see you in the next episode for the second and final part of the conversation with Paul Tremblay. But until then... Take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This 
Horror Podcast.